Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to day 13 of our COVID Alert Level 4 uh, lockdown and update. We'll start with the update today from the Director General of Health, uh, and then I will come back for some opening remarks. You'll note that we have uh, moved to a combined press conference. That's simply as we transition um, from really the early stages of Alert Level 4, and as we see some of those operational updates lessen a little bit, we will still be making sure that we have different operational leads who are available, for instance, um, the Commissioner of Police and so on, just to pick up any questions across those areas. In recognition, though, of a combined press conference, I will make sure um, that we linger longer in order to pick up any questions that you might have. But, Director General, we'll start with you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, so today there are a total of 54 new cases to report. 32 of these are confirmed cases and 22 are probable cases. There are no additional deaths to report and we can report that 241 people have now recovered from their COVID-19 infection. So the new total combined uh, of cases, both confirmed and probable, in New Zealand today is 1,160. Today there are 12 people in hospital and four of these are in intensive care units around the country, one in Wellington, one in Waitamata, one in Counties Manukau and one in Southern District Health Board. Uh, one of those people is in a critical condition. Uh, and one person has been discharged from hospital since our update yesterday. For the cases we have information on, 42% are linked to overseas travel, so that proportion continues to drop. Uh, and 41% are contacts of known existing cases. Uh, and we have confirmed community transmission at 2%. The balance we continue to investigate to get to the bottom of where they may have been infected. The ethnic breakdown is as follows, 73.3% European, 8.5% Asian, Māori is 7.8% and Pacific 3.4%. Uh, as usual we will publish all the details including demographic information on our website this afternoon. We're continuing to see testing happening across the country uh, the seven-day rolling average of the number of tests is 3,063. Uh, the total tests undertaken to date is 42,826. And yesterday there were 2,908 tests undertaken. Uh, we will be also publishing that daily test number on our website and we, we will do that from right from the start going right back to when we first uh, started testing so that people can map if they wish to the number of tests undertaken each day. Uh, our test capacity, despite that increase in test numbers, gradually continues to increase and as of uh, today we have enough tests on shore, complete tests, to do 44,000 tests and that will be up to between 50 and 60,000 even with ongoing testing by the end of this week. We have 50,000 nasal swabs in stock and are expecting a further 250,000 such swabs over the coming three to four weeks from a local supplier. People will be interested to know that the World Health Organization has updated its advice on the use of masks, in particular in the general population. And just in summary, the WHO does not recommend the use of medical masks by the general public, except in particular circumstances where someone is sick and wearing a mask protects others, or someone who is caring for a sick person and the mask can help to protect them. That advice is on the WHO uh, website. And a final comment, just to reiterate my point from yesterday, if you need medical attention for anything, whether it's COVID symptoms or a non-COVID illness, any uh, exacerbation of an existing illness, please do seek medical attention promptly. All general practices and other primary care providers are able to attend to your needs and please uh, get onto that quickly. And just to clarify that travel for essential health care uh, in another region, essential medical care, is classified as essential travel and people should undertake that travel to get uh, care that might be required out of their district and the advice on our website will be being updated today. I'll hand back to the Prime Minister. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, to begin with today, I wish to speak about the actions of the Minister of Health. As you will have heard, last night David Clark advised me that he drove his family to the beach for a walk in the early stages of the lockdown. He also offered me his resignation. I want to share with you what I shared with him. 
Under normal circumstances, I would sack the minister. What he did was wrong, and there are no excuses. But my priority above all else is our collective fight against COVID-19. That requires leadership amongst our DHBs. It requires a good understanding of workforce issues. It requires an intimate knowledge of the strengths and weaknesses of our health system, which we have been working so hard to rebuild. And of course, it requires knowledge of the complex nature of this global pandemic and what it means here in New Zealand. Simply put, I determined that we cannot afford massive disruption in the health sector or to our response because David Clark continues to possess what we require as our health minister to take on COVID-19. For that reason and that reason alone, Dr. Clark will maintain his role, but he broke the rules and he does need to pay a price. So while he maintains his health portfolio, I have stripped him of his role as Associate Finance Minister and demoted him to the bottom of our cabinet rankings. His Associate Finance Minister delegations revert to the Minister of Finance, with the exception of where they relate to budget oversight of Minister Robertson's other portfolios. They will go to Minister Parker. These changes are effective immediately. David Clark is under no illusions that I expect better, and so does New Zealand. On to COVID-19 related matters, I can also report that we do, as the Director General of Health says, continue to ramp up our testing capacity. We are testing more and more people and the growth in the number of new cases remains relatively consistent. While I still urge caution, this does suggest that what we are doing as a nation is working. This was echoed earlier today on 9 to noon by John McDermott, who leads the team of data scientists that I referenced on Sunday. He said over the next day or so, we could begin to continue to see the impacts of Alert Level 4. He says, quote, when numbers start to fall, that is the first indication your interventions are working. John explains we need to go through three phases. You start with our outbreak. Then secondly, you want linear, which uh, we have seen over the past few days. And thirdly is the phase where you see cases start to fall. He is cautiously optimistic that what we're doing with the lockdown is making a difference. But as with any data analysis, there are always possibilities of setbacks. But for the moment, we do appear at this early stage to be on track. Another reason, if one was needed, of the need to stay at home. Now is not the time to change any of our behaviours. Now that doesn't make the physical isolation any easier. So I also note today that we have announced a range of support being rolled out to help look after people, look after their mental health as we fight COVID-19. Details of a targeted Pacific community's health response to the virus have also been released. I can also share that as of last night, the government's wage subsidy scheme has provided support to preserve the jobs of over 1 million New Zealanders. The latest numbers show the over 435,000 applications have been made, almost 10,000 yesterday alone, and that has seen over 6.6 .6 billion paid out to help retain 1,073,120 workers. Finally, the Foreign Minister has just announced that New Zealand will enter into transient arrangements with a range of countries to make it easier for each other's citizens to get home. As you know, a major barrier to New Zealanders getting back here at the moment is the transit restrictions imposed by many other countries. And we, in turn, are also receiving an increasing number of requests from foreign governments to allow their nationals to transit through Auckland. I note that while this is a welcome development, and regardless of the countries involved, we will maintain strict criteria in determining the basis on which people can transit through New Zealand in order to protect public health and meet our level four requirements. That includes that any transiting passengers absolutely remain airside. Lastly, I do want to acknowledge the news this morning that Prime Minister Boris Johnson is currently in intensive care. Upon learning the Prime Minister had tested positive for COVID-19 some days ago now, I sent a message to him to pass on New Zealand's best wishes. He replied to that message and said that his thoughts were also, quote, with all our friends in New Zealand. This more than ever is a time when every nation is connected and I know we'll want everyone in the UK, especially 
the Prime Minister to know that we are thinking of them. Now, I am happy to take your questions. How can David Clark do his job effectively when he doesn't have the moral authority? Uh, he has made a massive mistake. Uh, what he did was wrong and there are no excuses for it. But I need to make decisions now in the best interest of New Zealand, disrupting our current plans to take on this global pandemic by removing the Minister of Health, in my mind, was not in the best interest of New Zealand. Well, can I tell you was the reason that it took lockdown. four days before his memory was jogged about this other breach? None of that matters. I wasn't interested in excuses. He wasn't interested particularly in offering them. He's made a mistake. He needs to pay the price, and he is. Just because he thought he'd been caught, though, because media put requests into his office yesterday afternoon about other breaches and whether he'd driven to other locations for recreation activity, that he only came clean because he thought That is he was not the case. case. That is not the case. Um, it was offered up over the course of him preparing for select committee this morning. But regardless of how it came up, regardless, there is no excuse. It was wrong. He needs to pay the price, but the price cannot be paid through our response to this global pandemic. We have a job to do, and I'm determined that we need to get on with it. How does he keep operating, though, when he's got this thing hanging over his head when you've said in a different circumstance, I'd sack you? Yeah, by acknowledging that he was wrong, by acknowledging that under different circumstances he would have lost his job. But he knows as well as I do that we have to put New Zealand first and we have to put the response to this global pandemic first. Nothing else matters right now. Will you, will you, their jobs? Sorry. Will you, will you reconsider once the lockdown's over? Uh, at the moment, our entire focus is on this pandemic, and we will have this with us for many, many months to come. I'm focused on getting on with it now, and he needs to too. I'll, I'll come back to you. Then. Is it appropriate that health is now the lowest ranking portfolio in Cabinet, particularly given the crisis we're in? He's had to pay a personal price for this, um, but I'm determined that our health system will not. Do you have lost, lost loved ones and haven't been able to give them proper send-offs because of the lockdown. Yes. People have made immense sacrifices. Women haven't had been able to have people support yes. them during childbirth or after childbirth. What message does David Clark's actions, what does it send to those people who have made those sacrifices or our frontline workers who are taking those risks every single day? And that is why you will hear, things? this is why you will hear no defence no excuse. He made a mistake. He must pay the price, but the price cannot be in our response to COVID-19. I have a duty of care to New Zealand, and it was my determination that removing him from this role at this time would not be in the best interest of that response that we must focus on. Would we come out of this thing? You'll sack him immediately? Again, I am totally focused on this and not on hypotheticals. We need to get on with the job. But how can he, uh, how can he continue when he Again, as I say, my focus is on responding to pa pandemic, and I've set out a number of different areas where it is critical that we have deep prior knowledge. Uh, the role that he must play within DHBs, the personalities he needs to know and understand across our health system, the inner deficiencies that already exist in our health system that we were well aware of and need to fix. I cannot lose the work that's being done nor the prior knowledge of the health system in this pandemic. He holds that. So we will hold on to that, but he must pay a price. Go ahead, Jane. Oh, do you think it would yeah. be challenging um, to bring someone up to speed? Yes. In this, and, and in terms of timing, how long do you think it would have taken? Yes, it would have been challenging. Um, and keeping in mind that it's not just, of course, the knowledge of this pandemic itself and its impact on New Zealand, um, but also the prior knowledge of our health system and where there are issues within our health system. I, I was not willing to sacrifice the time uh, that would be required to bring someone up to speed when we are in the middle of a global pandemic that would not have been the right decision for New Zealand. Does this, effectively, is, this is, sorry, this is still on the yeah, stomach. Sure. Does this effectively, though, just push him to the side because, I mean, you're, you're saying you don't have, have confidence in him. We're in the middle of a health pandemic and the health minister um, has an axe hanging over No, I have expressed, of course, through all of the details I've outlined to you about the prior knowledge required to do this job well, the standing that's currently required within his knowledge of the health system. Uh, I needed someone who has that to continue in this job, not someone to start fresh, not we're in the middle of a global crisis I've determined that this is the right thing to do, but he still must pay a price. Is he the guy for the job, though? Sorry, can I stick one more on that? Is he actually the guy for the job? Because we counted more than a dozen times that he had to kick to Dr. 
Dr Bloomfield this morning during the committee because he simply couldn't answer the questions. So has he, is he actually the guy for the job? Oh, look, I, I haven't seen every single... I've seen the outline of the select committee today, um, so I can't respond to individual, individual questions around detail that he may have determined to be operational. That's not unfair. But isn't that the point, Prime Minister, that if he was the person who had all the information, he'd be here in Wellington fronting these daily briefings? Again, I said right from the beginning, my expectation was that ministers fulfil the obligations we are expecting of every other New Zealander, and that is why I am here now reprimanding him, stepping him down from other portfolios and sliding him down the cabinet rankings. He must be a role model. But equally, I will not sacrifice our response to COVID-19. That has to be my absolute focus. Given the centrality of the health focus at the moment, why don't you take on the health minister portfolio yourself? Well, I, I of course have a role to play here, um, but I also have a role to play in supporting the Minister of Finance and the economic response, the welfare and wellbeing response, even some of the recovery packages that are specific um, to my areas too. My job is to continue to keep our all of government uh, response going. I'd need that additional focus on our health response and the Minister of Health Provides that. Have you sort of just reminded the ministers that they know what the rules are, um, and also? Have I've reminded them. I've reminded both our ministers and every member of my caucus, and I think it's obvious what our expectations are. I've been up here repeating them daily. I don't think that's been lost on anyone. It is certainly not lost on the minister of health. Was there any discussion this morning at the COVID committee about mandatory quarantining or toughening up um, border quarantines for people coming back? Yes, um, there was some discussion of that. Uh, I'm not expecting um, uh, final uh, advice and recommendations uh, in the next, well, I'm expecting them very shortly. There was a preliminary discussion, though, around uh, uh, our expectations and giving a steer to officials. What about the um, compliance aspect of it? Were ministers concerned that this group hadn't been uh, monitored as closely as they should have been? Into any future well, I think you've seen from every decision we've made at the border um, that we see it as an ongoing point of risk. And so we want to make sure that we remove that risk as much as possible. That's why we've only continued to ramp up. So quite frankly, regardless of the enforcement, I really want a watertight system at our border. Uh, and I think we can do better on that. Sir so, David Skeed was saying he, he feels that our quarantine efforts at the border could end up us staying in lockdown for longer than four weeks because they're not strong enough. And he feels that our inability to trace at pace when it comes to contacts could be our Achilles heel. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I did, I did see those comments. And I think you've always would have heard me say, and perhaps the, the Director General will have a comment on this too, that there are those three areas um, that we must be absolutely watertight on. Um, border restrictions, uh, where we did move faster than many other countries, and we have reaped the benefits of that. But border restrictions, the work on contact um, tracing, and of course, just general use of isolation and quarantining is a part of that. Um, on border restrictions, I've already indicated that we will, we will continue to ramp those up and we'll be doing that shortly. On contact tracing, the Director General has talked about the extra support we're putting in there. In fact, we want that backed up by uh, uh, new technological solutions. Uh, and also, many of you will have heard um, Dr um, uh, Aisha Verrill speaking frequently about her knowledge there. The Ministry of Health is proactively bringing her in to undertake an audit of our contact tracing and give us that extra assurance that we're doing everything uh, that we can there. Perhaps, Director General, is there anything further on uh, that you just, want to say in response to David Skeggs? Yes, just, I mean, two comments, and I agree with what uh, Professor Skegg was saying, that actually if we're going to go for the elimination approach, which is our extended keep it out, stamp it out, and for when we move down out into alert level three, we need to be very confident we are not letting new cases into the country at the border. So we are providing active advice to the yeah. to cabinet around options there. Been, the controls haven't been watertight. They remain not watertight. And isn't this still a risk even from the people that have been allowed under again, the again, I just want to point to the, the evidence base for that because that's making an assumption that people who are in self-isolation, which we've been using as a tool for the whole country, the whole country we've used self-isolation for and for border controls, we've used it since February. And I haven't seen to date suggestions that those individuals have been broadly flouting it and infecting people. What we've done though is leave no room for human error and leave no room for individuals to flout that because we can't risk it going forward. So that's why we've continued to ramp up. 
We now have a situation where well over a thousand people are in hotels monitored by the government, and that will only set to increase. That the, that the regime then is open to human error and is open to people being. Well, able so to is alert level four, um, but we have continued to rely on people following the rules, and I haven't seen. Uh, uh, suggestion um, that we have a broad, wide-ranging breach of that, but equally we don't want to leave room for that. So that's why we've continued to ramp up at the border. What's stopping you from quarantining all your arrivals immediately? Um, so from the very early days where we were asked about it, quite frankly, scale. I don't think there's a full appreciation of how many New Zealanders travel abroad. We literally had tens of thousands returning to New Zealand. Now, we had a process at the border to make sure that we uh, were picking up uh, symptomatic individuals, that we were giving the full uh, uh, requirements and expectations of them, that health line were checking. So we had measures in place, but you'll see we've continued to step them up as we've had the capacity and as the numbers have dropped. Well, now that it's slowed to a trickle, can you introduce... Yes. The... Yeah. And as I've said, I've already flagged that we are looking again um, to leave no room for error at the border. And so I warn New Zealanders that you can expect at our borders, we will be expecting more of you. Should government, of yep. owned, should government owned buildings be given commercial tenants rent relief? Uh, that's not an issue I've had raised with me. I wouldn't mind just having a bit of time to look at that if you wouldn't mind. Would your response if, if an SOE had um, gone ahead and incre increased their tenants rent? Uh, again, I wouldn't mind seeing some of the detail on that, but I would apply the same principle for everyone here around providing compassion for those who need compassion at this time. And I would provide that, that, um, that view generally. No exceptions for the government on that. The Minister of Defence in Thames Coromandel has said that there are a lot of people that they've discovered are flouting lockdown and travelling to holiday homes and they want the region blocked off. Will you entertain their request and how would you block off uh, that region? Yeah, I think we do need to send a clear message as we come into um, Easter. The same rules apply. The whole notion of stay local applies. And so I know people will be very tempted over this period of time that if they're in a position where they have a home um, at some, some distance from where they are, stay where you are. You know, just because it's Easter does not mean that the rules of Alert Level 4 have changed. Director General, you might have more to say on that perhaps right, because it is some public messaging we've been trying to share. Look, I think you've nailed it, uh, PM. Uh, if we are going to make the most of this period in this alert level, and the signs are promising, cautiously optimistic, then everyone needs to keep the f their, their foot on the pedal, yep. and that includes over Easter. Have a staycation. Yep. Yeah, what are your Some thoughts long on staycation. What are, what are your thoughts on um, the health portfolio now being the lowest rank in Cabinet? How you view that given the climate that we're in at the moment. I'm gonna, oh, I'm yeah. gonna allow the, the Director General to answer that himself, but I'm gonna jump in if we have too many political questions going to the Director Well, I'll continue General. to work very closely with the Minister of Health as I have done and since I started in the role. Yeah. Have got any updates uh, on the timing yeah. of the flight? Sorry. Have you got any updates on the timing of the through flight? Apparently some people have been balking at the price as well. Is there yeah. any sort of insur assurances the government can provide to help those who perhaps can't afford it? Yeah, so, uh, we do, under certain circumstances, there is provision for consular assistance, if, um, but that is under very particular circumstances, and they include, for instance, if someone has absolutely no financial ability to extract themselves from a country. Those are made all at a, on a case-by-case -case basis by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade on the ground. So I don't want to say that's a blanket provision, but it does exist for emergency situations. On the um, Peru repatriation flights, uh, there is a charge that they are being treated that it is not to, it does not cover the full cost of getting these New Zealanders out. I should be very clear on that. We are underwriting the cost of getting them out. They are being charged for the tickets, but not at um, the full rate of uh, a, a not full cost recovery. Uh, and similar prices to what, for instance, people paid on the recent flight from um, Peru and Montevideo. Uh, so not too dissimilar to what Australia had under their circumstances. Got recent numbers in terms of how many registered for that flight? Uh, no, I do not at this stage, no, but we can probably get that to you. Um, I imagine that they must be fairly close um, to extracting them given that we have a level of detail now around um, the, the price and ticketing for it though. It's the first day by my back of the envelope maths that the number of recovered people outnumbers the number of new cases, 65 to 54 if I'm right. Is this significant and can you expect that to maintain through the 
the, the flattening of the community. Dr. Bloomfield. Uh, well, I think the number of recovered cases increasing at a higher rate reflects that we did have a period probably a couple of weeks ago where the case numbers were going up uh, at, a, at a sharper rate. Um, we will expect the number, I, I think we will expect the number of new cases to continue to stay level and of course we're looking for that decline. I should say also, and I didn't mention the, um, the, the clusters, uh, we don't have any more significant clusters but the three largest clusters, <coughs> Marist College one, there is an additional five there, the Bluff one an additional 11 uh, there that have been tested and diagnosed and um, were already in self-isolation uh, and so we and the Matamata cluster up to 59 up one so over just over half of our um, our new cases are from extant clusters that we know and we've got people in close isolation and we're seeing the infection that it, this the, the infection that had happened play out so that's also important to know that quite a lot of our new cases are coming from those close contacts and we're not seeing very many now from um, people coming in across the border, remembering that anyone who comes in symptomatic is immediately quarantined, quarantined. and tested. I think it's also worth noticing, uh, noting that I think the last time we had tests at, um, uh, positive cases at this level was roughly two weeks ago. So that's also um, interesting to note. Again, don't wish to draw conclusions, but it is interesting to see that, that parallel. Jackson. Dr Bloomfield, is, is the most affected age group still 20 to 29? That is still yes. uh, the, the most effective. Actually, I think we categorise it sort of 20 to 39 or 20 to 29, and then up to 40. And that was just because those were the group that were travel. That was the group travelling back yeah. from overseas. Two, 286 okay. from the 20 to 29 year olds, and the next highest is the 50 to 59. But yeah, Dr. Bluth was absolutely right. The 20 to 49 group really do do dominate. Can I ask about nasal swabs? You say there are 50,000 in the um, nasal tests in the, in the country, so why in Auckland, Nelson um, and southern region and other regions shifting to throat swabs because they've run out of nasal swabs? Uh, well, because they can use uh, throat swabs for doing the nasopharyngeal swabbing while they wait for more supplies to come. So every time a DHB gets short, we can get swabs out to them immediately and they do let us know. And those throat swabs are inferior though, so why aren't those nasal swabs being distributed more, more evenly across the country? Well, my hope is that all the DHBs and individual practices are able to get us notice uh, before they run out so we can get the swabs we already have out to them in a timely way. Dr. Oh, yeah, back in the, oh, in the front. Dr. Dr. Bloomfield, the messaging from the beginning from the government has been that the people that are most vulnerable by 70 plus and those predominantly with respiratory issues. We spoke with some Māori doctors and given that Māori uh, have a wider range of health issues, more so than non-Māori, that actually Māori that are 60 plus can often be the vulnerable group and that a 70 plus is just a, a, a generic number that doesn't quite fit with Māori. What do you say to that? Well, under the current uh, Alert Level 4 arrangements, if in fact uh, the, the um, advice to everyone is the same and for anyone who might be, be vulnerable because of age or an underlying condition, and it's a mix of the two, they should be um, making sure they are staying at home and staying isolated. That's the best way they can be protected from the virus, regardless of age or indeed of pre-existing condition. So I think in the current arrangements, um, the advice stands for all groups. At the moment, just to update you, the moment the numbers for Māori who are presenting with COVID-19 is 91. Yeah, and so there were some very specific issues around Peru and the ability, um, because of the nature of their lockdown, to get them out. Uh, and I've seen some specific details on others. Obviously, I, I shared a little bit about um, uh, Austria yesterday, but I can look into India. I don't have that in front of me now. But I, do, I am aware that that's one of the areas we've got affected New Zealanders too. Can I just ask on the Otherwise, Fiji as well. Um, we've got some in Tonga, a small number in Samoa, around the world. On, on the Ruby Princess, um, yes. did the ship seek clearance to dock in Tauranga and or the Bay of Islands and what was the outcome of this? Uh, do we know about its travels in New Zealand? Yes, um, so I, I might ask the um, Director General to supplement what I'm able to share. I'm familiar with some of their activity in Wellington and I'm familiar with some of their activity in the Hawke's Bay. Uh, and of course, you'll remember that the obligations on uh, a cruise ship such as this 
uh, is to ensure that anyone who is unwell essentially does not disembark. And so I know specifically for the Hawke's Bay, I've been advised that those assurances were directly sought um, from uh, their um, medical officer of health, from the captain directly before individuals disembarked. Uh, what I'll add here is that on that basis, um, given you'll see we have cases in the Hawke's Bay, uh, I have asked Minister Parker to seek uh, legal advice from Crown Law uh, as to whether or not the Ruby Princess Royal in New Zealand fulfilled all of its obligations under our uh, laws, because of course we are now suffering the consequences of cases here in New Zealand as a result of that cruise ship. It's really, I, I'm seeking legal advice on whether or not we should be pursuing that further. So it's very preliminary stages. But of course, because they have existing obligations, because those obligations include making sure that people who are unwell essentially do not disembark, and we now have COVID-19 transmission that directly links back to that ship, not from passengers, but from people who had contact with passengers, that raises significant questions. And so I've sought legal advice around that. Uh, do you do anything well, further on that? Just in terms of the question about whether um, permission was sought to berth in Tauranga or the Bay of Islands. No, it wasn't. The shipping line took the decision to cut the cruise short and head straight from uh, Napier back to um, uh, to Sydney. They went south through the Cook Strait to do so. So they cut off, I think, the last two stops. Yes, um, the claim yeah. there was that uh, weather meant that they would depart straight after the Hawke's Bay. So that last check did happen, as I understand. I'm advised that last check happened at Hawke's Bay and then they left. Can you give us an update about how many arrests there have been of people flouting the law so far? And every time, usually, I have that number straight in front of me, but I haven't brought it down with me um, today, Jason. I do, I've actually, do I've you got handed these just before. So there have been 291 breaches of the CDM Act or the Health Act. 16 people have been prosecuted, 263 warnings and 10 youth referrals. You know, Tommy David Clark should have known better. Um, there was a policeman who was spotted hunting days after the lockdown on the west coast. Um, I guess he should have known better. But also, a patient went into Invercargill Hospital knowing that they had COVID nineteen. Yes. And um, this has now resulted in um, mm. medical staff having to self isolate. Do yes. you have a message for these people, and should they face consequences? Yeah, I mean, on the issue of the individual who went into hospital. Uh, you know, from, from what I've seen of the case, it leaves a strong impression that in order to access uh, surgery, um, that individual was not open about uh, their health status. Um, and that puts them at risk, and it puts the health uh, staff who are there to look after them at risk too. Now, I think this feels like an obvious statement to make, but if you have COVID symptoms, uh, if you do not tell health professionals, even before you have contact with them, by picking up the phone, you are putting their lives at risk. Uh, and we just can't tolerate that, regardless of how urgent someone considers their surgery to be. We cannot tolerate that. That, though, is an issue and to, uh, as to any repercussions for that person. That's not a matter for me, but my message on it is very clear. I've got a special duty police officer who was hunting. He should have known better. Yeah, yeah, again, they should. Um, uh, hunting was an area where I will acknowledge in the early days I did see some conflicting advice going out on hunting, um, so I just see that issue there. Um, but ultimately that is for the police to follow up on their own team and making sure that they do fulfil the expectations that have been set out for Alert Level 4. Just, um, what to the um, yeah, right to the back. Thousands of people are walking into dairies right now and purchasing um, products by pressing F plus pads instead yes. of using contactless payments because not available. Yep. Um, is that a public health issue and what are you doing about every it? Every time you go outside, uh, when you return, wash your hands. I cannot say that often enough. And I say that, you know, if you go to the supermarket, yes, the supermarkets have actually put in quite rigorous protocols that they're using, trying to sterilise uh, trolley handles, trying to make sure that they give people the ability to keep as sterile as possible while they're there. But if you go out, when you come home, wash your hands. What do you you're doing around making contactless payments more available? Well, not payments? even if even then, I mean, that they're not utilised by everyone. And I think we need to keep that in mind. We have thought about that, though. It's one of the reasons, obviously, in public transport now, people aren't having to have that interaction with the drivers for that very reason. Um, but regardless of whether contactless payment existed more widely, there will be still people who wouldn't use it, who choose not to, um, and equally, uh, who still want and need to access um, 
personal one-to-one bank services as well. So we do need to remember that part of the community. In regards to the mental health announcement by David Clark this morning, which he sort of managed to overshadow himself, there wasn't any specific information. I'm sure you won't though, Joe. He didn't manage to um, provide any information about how it's actually going to be rolled out, where people are going to be able to access this. There was no specific information for teenagers, young adults, who we know are the at-risk group in yep. New Zealand. Your government's been very clear about wanting to provide more information and more support for mental health, yet this seemed to be a reasonably small announcement with very, very little detail. And so um, what I can share with you at the moment, this is we are going through in the same way that you've seen the Unite COVID-19, We'll be using similar ways to access New Zealanders. So a lot of use of our social media and online platforms um, to access uh, New Zealanders and share a strong message around uh, looking after their public, uh, their mental health. So there will be tips um, directing people to places where they can uh, look for information on how to look after themselves. It's been rolled out now, but there is a specific set of. Um, information uh, that is also being designed specifically for those, uh, for instance, who um, have recently had a baby and have specific may have specific needs at this time too. So we are starting to segment that as well. Director General, you might have something you want to add on that. I don't have any further detail. Um, I would say though there are a number of existing resources already, online resources and of course um, 1737 and uh, other resources like Youthline. So, um, this is really to complement and bring to the attention of people what those other resources are, but also some specific messages about being under alert level four and how to stay, how to stay well. Um, what I should add is that this has been designed by the Mental Health Foundation and the Canterbury DHB because of their expertise and having gone through the likes of the earthquake. Um, it will be supported by um, mobile apps, um, which also link people into telehealth services, which is obviously something we use now. One seven three seven. We are monitoring the number of people who are referencing COVID-19 when they call in those, uh, that number. And we can see that there have been periods of spikes and then um, it's come back a little bit in recent times. One of the other specific part of this program though is the use of sparklers. Sparklers is a program that we supported in the budget. It specifically focuses on support and resilience of children who are undergoing periods of anxiety and stress and distress. And so it is evidence-based and I really encourage parents look out for um, the Getting Through Together campaign, look out for the details that come out there, do access the programs for kids because they're, they're really um, well thought through. Both of you about the Crusaders. How disappointing was it to see professional rugby players from three different bubbles out training together? Yeah. How dangerous was that decision? It is. It flies directly in the face of the advice that we're giving, and um, you know, I would just say to uh, those who are in positions uh, like that that we are relying on everyone to role model the behaviour we need right now, and we are all in this together. And uh, I'm really asking on. Uh, for those, you know, for those uh, leaders within our sporting codes to join us in this because we can't do this alone. No one can be exempt. There seems to be some, some confusion over butchers, grocers and bakers and whether they are able to operate online services. Yep. Can you just clarify that for, for people watching whether that's allowed? Yeah, so um, you will have heard me reference a few times now that the access, access to whole food was something that from day one when we made a decision around essential services just being supermarkets, that people could access whole food provision online because there are another number of places that already provided that. Where there has been some uh, question mark is for those who only offered a retail offering, then transitioning into online sales and establishing new ways of doing things that did open up some risk because they wouldn't have been established processes for those businesses. I expect to have that conversation with our ministers again tomorrow about that specific issue. But what I would say is that through all of this, our priority has been reducing down contact with people as much as possible, and that will continue to be our primary focus. So what do you say yeah, to Jane. temporary visa holders or immigrants here in New Zealand whose um, immigration status may be a bit unclear? Will they get help to get home if they need to? Um, what's being done here yeah, for those people who are probably in quite a, a unique situation? Do you mean pr primarily people on work visas? to change to extend some, but yes. we've just got questions about some people feeling their status is a bit grey, they feel like they haven't really 
been given much information yeah. about what's happening with them. So under the um, epidemic notices, we've had the ability to make sure that people, um, through no fault of their own, uh, were in a position where um, either their visa status had uh, um, expired, but they had no ability to leave the country. So we've made provision for that. On the issue, though, specifically of people on work visas who have lost their jobs, um, this is a discussion I've had with the Minister of Immigration, um, because as you can imagine, that does happen from time to time, even outside of these, this extraordinary period. Uh, we rely on people on work visas as a part of a condition of their visa, having the ability to support themselves if they, be in, if they find themselves in that situation. So they are tested to ensure as part of their conditions that they do have some resource. Um, but we also recognise this is at particular times. And so this is a bit of an ongoing discussion with ministers, um, something that we have had raised with us and that we are looking at. So it's a method to, I believe, Australia is helping repatriate some of those people. Is that part of the discussion, you know, to their home countries? Yeah. Is that part of the discussions here? At, that far yeah, that I, it, we're looking at the whole ambit. You know, if we've got a situation where people here were previously able to work, now cannot work, and now cannot get home, um, that is of course a problem that we need to be involved in working through. Available, they are eligible, aren't they, for benefit support? Effects? They have. They do not have the same eligibility if they're on a work visa. Dr. Bloomfield, are you able to confirm uh, how many people are infected in the Hawke's Bay cluster in terms of so uh, in that uh, Ruby Did Princess related cluster, there were there are six people who were passengers on the ship. They're not in Hawke's Bay, but have since come back from Sydney. And then the, the balance, so that's, um, there were four people who, uh, were, who were either tour guides, one was an interpreter, one was a bus driver, and then contacts of one of those is another six. So the total is 16 in the cluster, no change from yes, yesterday. Yep. Yep. Just to follow up on the press statements, one of the players has a pregnant wife at home. How dangerous could that have been for her in breaking his bubble? Well, I can't comment on the specific situation, but um, he may well be in as much trouble at home as he is in the media. I'd say that's probably true. I'll just take, I'll just take a last couple. If anyone's got questions on behalf of others that they haven't asked. Okay, I'll give you, Jenna, I'll give you one more. And then, Derek, just because you look so... Um, appalled, I'll give you one. Another one for both of you, please. Um, it's World Health Day. What is your message to everyone that's working in the health sector right now? Uh, well, look, if I could start, because you're one of them, um, and so really we should be paying tribute to Dr. Bloomfield as much as we should um, everyone. Uh, I wonder sometimes whether we underestimate the importance of public health and our health workers until we either have to access our health services, or a family member does, or we're in a global pandemic. It shouldn't take that to remind us how important they are, but may we never forget how important they are. Uh, Derek? Do you have a, do you have a... Oh, sorry, sorry, you may wish to... Well, well, just the comment I made after Fakati White Island was that I feel we have an excellent health system in this country. It's by no means perfect, but I have yet to find a country with a perfect health healthcare system. But the, the state of our health system is directly the responsibility of the people who work in it, and we have fantastic people who work in our health system, so we're very, very fortunate. Um, uh, 54 new cases the last in two weeks. Uh, how confident can we be on that downward trend given the given the gaps in the testing data on regional and demographic gaps. And is there any light you can shed on, on, on where those gaps are, which regions, what kinds of groups of people? So I think we can be increasingly confident. One of the advantages of the um, centralised contact tracing uh, platform we've put all that onto, an electronic platform, is we will be able to link now with the laboratory testing data, and we will be able to, this week, show the pattern of testing by region and also demographically by ethnicity, um, by age group, and so on. So that will help us get a good understanding. Uh, there are two other important pieces of information we talked about this morning at Select Committee. One is that we've seen in the last few days the number of close contacts of each of our new cases has dropped down to two or three, reflecting the fact that we are in the alert level four, so people are in small groups, and so the number of close contacts they have is very small. And the other is a comparison that the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor got her team to do just um, in the last day or so, which looks at our mortality rate compared with, so look at our number of deaths compared with the number of cases we have, and it's very low, it's 0.1% at the moment.
Um, and uh, you've seen in countries that have got widespread community transmission yes, yeah. that their death rates are much higher. France and Spain, 12%. So this is, is, is triangulating all the information we have that suggests we didn't, at least two weeks ago, have much community transmission going on. And then we went into uh, alert level four, which really will really assist us with breaking that chain of transmission. So you've got... Any sort of undetected transmission there? There may be, uh, but we're, and we're keeping a close eye for, on, on it, but uh, the signs are good. <laughs> Quietly confident and cautiously optimistic, so make of that what you will. I've been, and then I'll come to you, Joe. Have you been briefed on the devastation um, due to the Tropical Cyclone Harold? No, actually, just as I was um, preparing to come down, I've, I've sought some ad additional information. Unfortunately, at the moment, what I've seen is more the reporting, um, but I will ask for an update from MFAT, particularly, obviously, for the people of Vanuatu, who we are primed and ready to assist as required, but also the New Zealanders who are there. Jo? Have you had any thoughts or further information or updates in regards to whether a September election is going to be No, 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 I have not. I've been um, focused, as you can imagine, on this particular period, Alert Level 4. Um, really, I feel it's too early um, for me to say um, what situation New Zealand will be in even a month's time. Um, so I'll continue, though, um, to make sure, though, that we give plenty of consideration to that with a good lead time. Um, Jessica. Yeah, Jessica, just with Vanuatu, how much more challenging will it be, um, given the circumstances we were all operating now, to be able to assist, and will we still be able to fully assist? Yeah. That yes, we will, and I don't anticipate that being challenging because uh, our defence force, um, as a matter of course, have to be ready and able to deploy um, within a very short period of time, no matter what status New Zealand is in. And that's in case we have any uh, natural disasters domestically or in case they're called upon internationally or for even surveillance purposes within our, uh, within our waters. And so they're always at the ready, no matter what New Zealand's situation. Last one, Tova. Thank you. Are officials investigating reports of fraud by employers not passing on the wage subsidy? Uh, uh, yes, that has always been built into our scheme. I'd have to check... Uh, what the status is of though, any investigations, because we've always said, yes, there's a statutory declaration, it is a high trust model, but we will be following up on uh, ensuring that if there are any anomalies, if issues are raised by employees, um, that we have uh, a team ready and available to investigate any misuse. I believe we've actually beefed up the enforcement team for that purpose as well. On Federal's information, is there, um, could you consider loosening some of the criteria around that to allow maybe one person or two people to attend a cremation or a small service uh, if they're in full protective gear or whatever. But Outside of bubbles, because of course people who are within bubbles can, but it's when you mean people who haven't been in contact with one another. Yeah, people who weren't able to go to a crematorium to be with their loved one when they were yeah. cremated. This, is a, this has been an area where there's been utter consistency because as you can imagine, being such a traumatic experience and time for people. We've provided advice on tangi, cremation, graveside burials, and access to funeral directors, and that's all available on the COVID-19 website. One of the things that I would just, and this is devastating to have to point out, but one of the things you all have seen from some of our clusters is, is it's, it, they're a slice of New Zealand life. You know, they're, they're weddings, um, uh, the you know the the functions in our small towns, the conferences, the rugby teams, that any social occasion where people are coming together, and unfortunately, a high risk time is when people come together to grieve. How do you reconcile not being able to go to a cremation, but being able to go to a dairy on the way home and pick up some milk? Because when you grieve, you reach out for personal contact, you reach out to one another, uh, and that's what we do at weddings as well. And we have uh, an enormous cluster as a result of one of those. I've, I've said many times before, I don't want grief on grief, and that's one of the devastating byproducts of what we're having to do. Okay, oh, last one. Yep. yep. Um, would that ship have been quarantined as the captain had reported symptoms on the ship? Because we had that power under the Health Act, did we not? Yeah, yeah. And so, of course, um, you'll know that there were questions asked and tests undertaken in Wellington. And so, yes, there would have been um, repercussions if, if there were positive tests there. Okay. Sneaky last one. Simon Bridges has said that his internet isn't good enough and that's why he has to travel to Wellington um, to, from Tauranga. Um, what do you make of his excuse? I didn't pass any judgment on it yesterday and I won't pass judgment on it today. Ultimately, we made uh, the form for the Select Committee uh, available in such a way that um, e every member could um, stay um, home 
uh, in order to participate. But ultimately, there's an element there of the personal choice of those MPs as to how they wish to do that. Okay, thanks everyone.